So welcome everyone joining us today. My name is Julian Brown. I am the editor of the Lumu blog. And today we'll have a short chat about the reality of enduring and overcoming a breach or a severe cybersecurity incident. We're going to be focusing on the lessons to be learned from such an experience and also aiming to break some of the stigmas around talking about a breach. To lend his insights, we have invited Michael Coates. Michael was formerly the CISO at Twitter, Mozilla, and CoinList. Most recently, he was the founder of C and CEO of Altitude Networks. Michael, welcome, and thank you so much for joining us. Thanks. Happy to be here. So, Michael, to get us started, can you describe to us, in your own words, uh, an example of a breach that you have led a team through? For sure. Uh, I've... <laughs> experienced a number of very interesting security scenarios over the years, given the roles that I've been at. Um, a couple come to mind in particular to talk about. Uh, most recently at Twitter, um, I dealt with some pretty interesting security situations, to say the least. In 2015 or so, uh, we had a nation state uh, attack um, that was perpetrated by uh, Saudi Arabia. Um, coordinated with inside employees. So really the worst scenario that you might be thinking of, both uh, well-funded adversaries, um, insider uh, employees, uh, really all the challenges that come to mind. Um, and also another one that comes to mind is shortly thereafter, maybe the next year, a, we'll call it a data breach, but it really wasn't. It was a purported breach where an attacker claimed to have millions of usernames and passwords for Twitter um, had reached out to journalists saying that they had this information. And it was then our job to then figure out if this was true. Um, ultimately, we discredited it. It was not true. Um, but still, it went through the breach, um, you know, breach handling, breach scenarios. Um, so both of those were um, incredibly difficult, interesting tasks to have worked through, um, but happy to dive into those as we talk here more. Right. So the first of those definitely sounds like worst case scenario, but I'm sure that both were almost equally stressful. Can, can you take us through that like initial reaction, that moment when you find out that something's happened and what that's like as a security operator? For a data breach, there's going to be any number of ways that you get notified from it being potentially a, a system itself that is behaving oddly that you detect yourself to somebody reaching out to the company, uh, claiming to have information or um, <clears throat> you know uh, information coming to you from government channels. And in all of those cases, the first reaction, of course, is your heart stops. There's a bit of panic. And you immediately go into this thinking of, all right, how do we begin to gather the information and data to prove, disprove, uh, investigate further? Um, who do we need to call into the room uh, to begin to tackle this? Uh, what systems are going to be involved? And uh, ideally, you know, you're thinking about how you're prepared for this already. You're thinking about the, the run books, the playbooks of, uh, you know, what you're going to do. Um, tactically speaking, it's also a moment where you clear the calendars. <laughs> Uh, you call everybody up, you say, well, you know, we're, this is all hands on deck. Uh, and you end up having many late nights uh, repeatedly as you as you go into those uh, investigations. Can you give us a little bit more detail about what it's like in that warm room in those days following the, the, the situation? You know, inside the war room, I mean, obviously, the, the atmosphere is tense in the sense that People are, you know, diligently reviewing logs um, and, uh, you know, systems that have information about what's going on. It's very much a puzzle, you know, piecing together the different uh, sets of information that you have and following trails of, all right, we've got this piece of information. Let's pull that thread and uh, seek it through. You know, in some regards, Hollywood is very wrong about cybersecurity, but in some situations, they're right. If you imagine the number of people um, hunched over their laptops, you know, pizza boxes, whiteboards, you know, uh, people kind of running in and out, it's not that wrong. Um, and I think what that is is it's the it's the investigation and pursuit of 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 the information. And 
there's no single simple way just to you know ask a question and get this answer of ah well this is the person that did it here's the entirety of all information from every system um so there's uh, always combining things together and seeking things out and cross-referencing and then finding finding the right people that have access to the different information. Um, your security analysts, your security team members will be able to do a large amount of, of activities, but they still will at times go to a system operator or an owner to clarify, how does the system work? This log that appears to be this way, we think it means this, but let's clarify that. Um, and then all of that while running updates to the rest of the organization, to management and leadership, of you know here's where we are here's what we know here's what we don't know um you're getting pings from you know the press team like can we issue a response we're getting inbounds so it is very it is very tense um and and lots of different things happening all at once it it sounds like a lot of responsibility especially to to yourself as as CISO running that environment and being connected to so many different people does it feel overwhelming at all it's definitely overwhelming. I think that's one of the most important uh, attributes in these situations is the crisis mode. And as a leader in crisis mode, your goal is to be level-headed, calm, to deal with incomplete sets of information, to be able to um, help direct uh, people, help unblock them while not panicking, um, you know, focusing on the things that matter the most, even though, again, you have incomplete information. And so, you know, I think it's a trait of CISOs in general, um, but you want to have that ability to to stay calm under pressure, and that's certainly the the most heightened uh, example or scenario you're going to experience for it. Mm, absolutely. Um, so, in your opinion, does that mean that that you have failed already in some way? If you are experiencing a breach, does that mean that somehow you have not succeeded in your job? I think it's a really good question. Um, in some regards, security over the years has been looked at that the team that is intended to prevent all breaches. And I feel like that is a misguided perception of how a security teams should operate um, in the sense that if a security team is given the, the goal of preventing all breaches, then they would crush all risks at all times, which would mean they would nullify any business decision that introduced risk to the business. And that would be you know, a silly way to operate a business from that risk perspective. On the other hand, consumers and businesses that do business with other companies expect their information to be protected. And they don't really care about the internal dynamics of your company. Um, their expectation is you protect things that are given to you. Uh, and so it puts you in this juxtaposition of, well, how does a business operate when they have to have some level of risks um, and they have to establish trust with their customers? So I think I think to answer that question, a data breach does not necessarily mean failure, but that's with a very big asterisk because the specifics matter so much. And what matters here is is how bad is that breach and how much did you prepare ahead of time? Because there is an understanding that there is some limit that any company can um, can exclude, can, can use uh, in preparation. Um, they understand that at some point in time, you have done everything possible and perhaps more so, and this thing did take place and some amount of information may have been, been breached. But I think what, consumers and businesses won't understand or the public at large is, or they won't approve of, is if the breach is egregious. If you didn't do what you were supposed to do, if you concealed what happened, if the breach um, was so extensive because you didn't have mitigating controls. And I think that's where the answer really lies. The expectation is that you will be well prepared, you will have implemented all of industry standard security controls, you will have planned and prepped for a data breach. When a breach happens of any sort, you'll be forthright um, and public about what happened, what you know, what you don't know. And because you have layers of controls, that data breach will not be catastrophic. I think if you are in those categories, you haven't failed. But if you don't have those items true, then I do think a data breach could mean 
failure. Interesting. Okay. Um, so looking at the aspect of information sharing, um, I mean, obviously you have to share information with the public as much as possible. Um, but do you think that we're doing enough in terms of sharing threat intelligence or th sharing best practices across the industry? Information sharing is a really good question, um, especially around data breaches and cyber threats. There's been a continued conversation of public-private partnerships from governments, and there's been efforts amongst uh, industry groups to do you know, business-to-business -business or commercial-based uh, sharing of, of threats. Every time it comes back to a challenge of, of trust, <laughs> of how do you share this information to make it actionable from, from the receiving party, I think there are small pockets that are operating well amongst individuals that are already trusted. But unfortunately, those are just small pockets. In essence, we have the entire bad guys against all of us. So the more us good guys can share broadly to each other to, to easily share indicators of compromise, to, ch uh, to share new TTPs, all of that would be incredibly beneficial. And as much as we talk about this objective, which everyone agrees we should do, I think in many cases, we failed to find a practical way to make that happen in a larger scale. Um, and doing so would only help us. It would help us all because the attackers are continuing to, uh, they're nimble, they're continuing to evolve. They are essentially businesses that have optimized each chain of uh, each stage of exploitation. And if we're not being just as nimble and having just as much information, then we're going to be even, you know, at a bigger disadvantage. So there's a lot more to do there. Right. Um, thanks for that. And then I, I want to talk a little bit about the team, because obviously it's not just one person. There's a lot of people, you know, inside the SOC team and many other partners potentially involved with that. Um, did you learn anything about your team did, going through that situation? You definitely see, you know, who who are the people that are ready to operate under pressure. Um, you you find out who um, who's even more creative. Uh, they run into an obstacle and they say, ah, you know, we this information doesn't match the format that we are expecting, or we need to cross reference this information with this other information. So you find out who's you know got that grit under pressure. Um, <clears throat> you will see again. The people that are thinking like an attacker, um, because some of this is is psychology and motivation. Like, there's a lot of things that could technically take place, but the question is like, what did the attacker do? Um, which way did they navigate through a system? So, the people that are thinking in that way, almost in a detective mindset, um, that very much comes to light. Um, and then on the other side, you'll see people that are really demonstrating a core characteristic, which is that organization under disarray. Like they're taking all of this disparate data and they're formulating it down into a concise report of what happened. Um, it's distinct timelines of, you know, we know at A and then B and then C, these things took place. Um, we have a gap here and they kind of acknowledge that clearly as a gap and then they move on. Um, so that's another element that's critical of, of the skills and, and you see that come to light. Um, and you see people that, um, you know, you see them under stress. You know, we're working many hours into the evening. We all thought we were going to go home and have dinner with our families. But night after night, we're there quite late until, you know, the brain cells, you know, stop really operating. Uh, and you see how people function under those environments. So it's quite a bit different than, you know, any sort of normal business operating, you know, with your, with your uh, peers. Um, and if you've if you've built a good solid team, that pays dividends and rewards extensively in these moments where they really need to shine. So if you were building a SOC team today, are these the characteristics that you would look for? It's a good question. I think some of the best security, you know, engineers, analysts, et cetera, that I've worked with, one of the common traits among them is one, they have a, an interest and a curiosity for technology, but I think that's kind of a, a gimme, like that's a good skill for a lot of people in technology. But two, they have very unique and varied backgrounds. And what I found is many of these people that have just done exceptionally well, 
in their past, they have been put in situations um, that are, I guess, over their head or new um, or unique. And they're not necessarily related to technology, um, but they have found a way to thrive in these situations. And that is a characteristic of a person that can be applied in many different areas. Uh, you know, one person that I worked with, um, they had a previous job where they led um, work on a farm and they had to, to coordinate uh, tens or more of people doing different sort of farmhand activities. Um, and it seemed like a, like the question was, like, did you have experience? I was like, well, no, I just figured it out. It's a, that just figured it out mentality. Another person was an EMT dealing with high stress, you know, medical emergencies, not because they were trained per se in medicine, but because they pursued that. And again, as a characteristic of them. Um, and that really showed as they applied it to their technical skills uh, as well. That's really interesting, especially with the, the cybersecurity talent shortage that people keep talking about. Um, and the fact that we need to look for cybersecurity talent in, in different places. Um, I think yeah. Forrester also suggested EMTs as being a, a good source. Yeah, the talent shortage concern also is a reflection of the immaturity of the industry. Um, the fact is there are far too many security teams or leaders that are hiring what I would call unicorns or trying to. Like you need to have 15 years of this, 10 years of that, et cetera, et cetera. And that's just not a realistic job description. Um, it's mm -hmm. too senior. It's overlapping disciplines that don't overlap to the degree they want. And what it reflects is that they have not gone into their teams and really broken down the roles into distinct levels. Uh, you should be able to have distinct senior roles that are achievable skills and also pull out junior tasks for up and coming new talent, new people. And you should be able to build a pipeline of amazing people into those new junior roles. Um, and specifically at both Twitter and Mozilla, we had a wonderful pipeline through programs like uh, Year Up. It's a, an alternative training program um, for students. Um, and that was a wonderful way of getting new junior folks in, we had um, you know, new internships uh, and such like that. And really, if you have an actual pipeline, you can have a, a wonderful way of building those levels of, of talent. So I don't know, I don't know if I buy the shortage. I think a lot of that falls back on us. Mm -hmm. uh, we agree completely on that. <laughs> um, we've written about that before. Um, and then, uh, so cybersecurity is something that's con constantly evolving. There's always like, a new tool coming out, a new acronym every year. Um, do you think there's any tool that exists now that you wish you could have had when these incidents happened? Um, at the end of the day, you want, you want all the information you can and you want it in a single place that's easy to query and cross-reference. Um, we've, I mean, we have the entire ecosystem, all the security tooling from, you know, endpoint security to NIDs and HIDs and um, any other sort of instrumentation. We have, you know, sort of the concepts of SIM um, and maybe even, you know, automated response and pipelines like SOAR. They all have good um, objectives, but it really comes down to, at the end of the day, do they work? Um, do they work at the size and speed and scale that you have? Um, I think... What would I have wanted? I would have wanted would have wanted more centralized data, more easy ability to query and cross reference. Um, and it sounds simple, but those things are hard. <laughs> those things are hard to get right. So I think the more companies can prepare to have the right data at their fingertips um, with ease of uh, ease of querying and even preset um, search you know, looking for common methods. And I guess by that, I mean, we don't need to reinvent the wheel every time. Like let's have, like, let's have things done for us automatically. Let's leverage computers where computers are strong and then reserve humans for the problems that are so hard that they need human thought. Right, so it sounds like something that helps with investigation. <clears throat> I, I, I sometimes feel like people don't appreciate just how much time can go into it, investigation. I, I, that's exactly it. Yeah, the, the reason we're querying is because we're trying to do that investigation. We're trying to figure out the trail um, and then trying to take that into 
a concise you know statement of facts um, that we can share with others because that's the end goal like let's take let's turn this you know data into knowledge mm, absolutely um different question i uh, hear um in what way do you think that experience has made you a better um, professional cybersecurity professional or what characteristics have you developed through that that experience going through breaches shows you the ultimate goal of what you're trying to prevent and the reason that's important is so much of security is hand wavy or embellishment um, and it shouldn't be there's a number of you know motivations in security that are unfortunately driven strictly by checkbox compliance and it 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 puts you at the point of understanding fundamentally what matters and one thing i'll say and maybe some people will uh, shirk to this is, you know, security for compliance is very different for security to not get breached. And we will do security for compliance to continue operating as a business, but that's not where you stop by any means. <laughs> you have mm -hmm. to keep going to have security to not get breached. And, and that's how you look at things. Um, you can look at something, um, a requirement to do um, encryption at data at rest in your cloud instance. You're like, are, all right, we can do this for purposes of compliance, but tell me how that protects me from getting breached when the data is always in motion and the attacker would come through the application anyways. And so those are the types of thinkings where you really say, all right, what would stop an attacker and how are the attackers actually focusing on breaking into companies today, not what are the compliance standards? So yeah, going through a data breach, it makes it all very real. Hmm. I see. Um Knowing what you know now, do you think there's anything that you could have done better when those um, situations occurred? Some of the things that we did prior to those particular data breaches helped us get better. Um, and so I was glad that we had small issues that turned out to be you know, nothing that helped us refine. And by that, what we really refined was our method of communication, um, our method of organization and planning. Those non-technical elements were huge. And so we would have, for example, you get a bug report in, and that would then drive a quick investigation to confirm that the bug had not been exploited. Um, those things would you know, push on our policies and procedures and our communication to leadership those things all got better every time. You know, when I started at Twitter, um, those things were lacking, um, you know, in terms of, we did communication to leadership, but, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't well organized. It wasn't formatted well. It didn't answer the questions they needed, for example. And so going through these small investigations refined all those things, how we stood up investigation uh, communication, how we uh, rallied people uh, that needed to be brought in those things were refined by trial runs that we did uh, ahead of time. And so I think because we did those things, we learned the items that we needed to do better. And so when the breach did come around, we were in a good position. Um, but of course, going through the full exhaustive data breach investigation always stresses uh, your systems. And it, it makes you want to have, again, more data, more centralized, more easy to query. Right. Yeah. It's I guess it's one of those things where you constantly have to keep improving, right? Um, you can't ever really stop and say, this is, this is the level that we want to be at. Um, do, do you think the, the public appreciates um, the severity of cyber threats in general? And um, are there any misconceptions that you'd like to clear up? I think because of the frequency of headlines today with data breaches, people are starting to have an appreciation for the, the real risk that it poses. It you know, certainly was different you know, maybe 10 years ago um, when it still posed quite a risk, um, but it's definitely very present today. I think the, the area in terms of you know, misconceptions, um, I think there's still a misconception on the amount of investment that companies need to make um, to really 
defend their their organizations. And that's something that because security is becoming a boardroom issue, I think the security leaders are able to, to help drive that in the right direction. Every company is uh, struggling with how much of investment does it take uh, to actually you know, protect your environment. Um, and that's both through you know, personnel um, and you know, expert tooling and, and such. Um, so I think that's one area that's gonna continue to evolve. But, but definitely needs to, to keep going forward. So especially with communicating with the boardroom, it does feel sometimes like the, the boardroom speaks a different language and can be difficult to, to come across to them. Do you have any advice for communicating with, with a, your board? One of the most important things as you're working with your board is to understand how the business works and understand what matters at the top level in the sense that, in a boardroom, it doesn't matter if you have a zero day vulnerability. That's like, I mean, you're gonna get this question of so what? Um, this is all, you know, this is about p &L, This is about, you know, potential risks. Um, this is about time to market. This is about strategic maneuvers. So you have to take all the things that are happening and convert them into terms that matter to the business. You know, these types of issues um, could result in, here's where compliance comes in perhaps, you know, not being compliant, which results in our product not being able to ship this feature on this timeline, missing a strategic market window. Or uh, this particular set of issues that we've not invested to mitigate could result in a fine of this amount or could impact um, our company's uh, perception amongst our audience, which, you know, when talking with press and PR and marketing could drive down uh, revenues. So you have to take it and ask yourself basically the question of like, so what or why, like five times to get to the, to the actual answer, item that matters. The other thing is when talking with the board, you have to benchmark these things in terms of industry standards because they're going to say, all right, great, you know, companies get breached, but like, is what you're proposing enough? Is it too much? Like, why is that the right amount? And so having an understanding of benchmarks of here's where our peers are, here's where we are. Here's where our risk appetite is through conversations with leadership. Um, all of those things come together. And then you have to do all of that in like two to three slides <laughs> um, because you are just one part of the entire uh, conversation that's happening. Um, but you will be having those conversations with the board, with the audit committee, you know, on a regular basis. And you'll be up-leveling them um, as well. They'll be looking to you to be a leader, to speak in words that they understand in terms that matter. Um, but to do that with understanding, here's the risks, here are the plans, here are the options, here's the investments, here's how we can move forward. Right, I see. Uh, final question I have for you today is, um, if you have to give a CISO who has not experienced such a, these kinds of incidents, what's one piece of advice that you would give them? When you have a breach, you will learn things and you're like, man, if I could do this different, I would have had these things lined up and fixed ahead of time. I would have had these playbooks. I would have had these comms. I would have had these tools already. And you will say, man, I really wish I could do this again. So do that. Create the breach now. And you can do that through tabletops. You can do that through actual simulated controlled breaches again. And watch your team respond. See where things fall apart and learn all of those things you wish you would have known and then fix them. And that's exactly what I did at Twitter. In the first few months I was there, we did a simulated data breach. Um, it was confirmed between me and my boss and the head of legal. And we said, all right, we are going to simulate this breach where an outside party that we control um, says they have breached a database, they have user data, they will give this small piece of user data as proof. And what we will do is we'll send that to press and we'll say, I'm a reporter from such and such organization. I'm going to publish a story from the security hacker. This is the proof they have. Do you have comment? And we did that. And we watched what happened. We watched what happened from a comms perspective as press bounced around this uh, inbound request. We watched how long it took to get to security. We watched how security responded, how they gathered people, how they investigated. Um, and in that controlled environment, we saw the things that worked and the things that didn't work. And we made a number of changes to enhance it. So do that. Do simulated breaches, do tabletop, do sit around a table and do those every quarter so you can leverage that 2020 hindsight, but before it becomes hindsight. 
All right. Thank you. Thank you so much for all your insights. Uh, this has been absolutely fascinating for us, and I hope our audience has enjoyed it. Uh, do you have any final comments you'd like to make? Security is really hard. Have a good mindset, build an amazing network, hire wonderful people, and use the best tools that can help benefit you. All right. Michael Coates, thank you very much. Thank you.